Hey everyone, uh, I hope you're all doing well. Thank you for joining uh, tonight's event, which is our final panel of Made in NYC Week 2020, Manufacturing Pivots and Industry Resilience. I'm Joanna Reynolds, the Manager of Programs and Partnerships for Made in NYC. Made in NYC is a nonprofit local branding initiative that supports thousands of New York City's manufacturers and makers with marketing and branding services and a sense of community. Made in NYC now has over 1,400 member businesses and growing. And if your business is making a product in one of the five boroughs, you are most likely eligible for a free Made in NYC membership that gains you access to a plethora of tools, resources, and networks. So Made in NYC is an initiative of the Pratt Center for Community Development, a community-driven planning and development organization that works for a more just and sustainable New York City. And Pratt Center is a part of Pratt Institute. Made in NYC was started in the aftermath of 9-11 as a way to engage New Yorkers to shop locally and to get local businesses to connect with each other in order to sustain local supply chains. So similar to the moment that we're in right now, it was a time when celebrating and uplifting New York City, its small businesses and communities was critically and essentially important. Today's Made in NYC Week theme is all about resilience, recovery, and adaptation. We just at three at four o'clock finished up an incredibly inspiring conversation about inclusive design and employment for people of all abilities. If you missed it or any of our programs throughout Made in NYC Week, you can go watch and catch up on our YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter channels. So during the heart of the COVID-19 pandemic, many of New York City's manufacturers and makers pivoted their production to make products that were urgently needed in order to keep New Yorkers safe. Made in NYC Week is our time to uplift this story and to tell the narrative of a resilient New York City and a just recovery, spotlighting the manufacturers and makers who are essential to our local economy. Tonight's conversation will spotlight four manufacturers who jumped in to meet the moment and rapidly pivot to create essential products like masks, hand sanitizer, and face shields right here in the five boroughs. Um, your moderator tonight will be Libby Mattern from Course of Trade. We, and our panel is made up of Ella Hall from Stitch Room, Colin Spoolman from the Kings County Distillery, Christina Perla from Make Lab, and Michael Bednark from Bednark Studio. Thank you to all of our sponsors for Made in NYC Week. First off, a big thank you to the New York City Council who supports Made in NYC's work all year round. A special thank you to Council Member Antonio Reynoso and Speaker Corey Johnson for their continued support of Made in NYC. And thank you to all of our Made in NYC Week additional sponsors. We've got Square, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, Uncommon Goods, Goldman Sachs, Cozen O'Connor, the Greenpoint Manufacturing and Design Center, Lisk NYC, TD Bank, Verizon, City Point, Adafruit, Taproom, Outsnapped, and Steady Goods. <laughs> so before we get started, I'm going to play a quick video that will give you a little bit more information about Made in NYC, as well as the community of manufacturers that we work with here in New York City. The manufacturing industry is a lifeline for New Yorkers. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, New York City has been at the forefront of innovation, technology, and social change. It's the people, the families, and our communities that make the sector diverse, vibrant, and indispensable. Made in NYC was born after 9-11. We realized the best way to help our city rebuild from the rubble was to support New York's most vulnerable but essential industry, manufacturing. By providing companies with the tools to tell their own story of resilience, we have retained jobs, built community, and bolstered the local economy. 
Made in New York City supports my business by having regular events and fairs throughout New York City that helps educate the community that we're here, that we are part of an organization that's called New York City because we believe in New York City. Made in NYC is really important because it lets people know where to shop if you want to support New York businesses. You guys are actually promoting companies like us. Finally, you're giving companies that manufacture in New York City a platform. The Made in NYC Learning Lab offers over 40 workshops and creative services annually to members. All workshops and learning opportunities are run by faculty, staff, and students from the Pratt Institute. Programs like creative services, marketing strategy, and DIY photography are offered multiple times a year. Services like these bolster the skills of our local and small businesses. During the COVID-19 pandemic, New York's manufacturers didn't close. They pivoted. They are the ones who stood up to meet the needs of their communities. Sorry, Mike muted. I'm Libby Mattern from Course of Trade, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Uh, we have an incredible group of panelists with us tonight. We have Ella Hall from Stitch Room, Colin Spoolman from Kings County Distillery, Christina Perla from Make Lab, and Michael Bednark from Bednark Studios. So I would love to go around and have each of the panelists talk a little bit about uh, what they did before COVID. So if you can transport yourself back in time to 2019 before COVID disrupted everything that we uh, saw as normal, uh, then we'll be in a great frame of mind to talk a little bit about our pre-COVID experiences. So Ella Hall, if you can just start us off, if you can talk a little bit about what you've done before COVID. Hi, Libby. Hi, everyone. My name is Ella. Um, I am the co-founder of Stitch Room which is a made to order custom home decor startup. So we make everything from pillows to cushions to curtains, anything related to your home that you'd like made locally. That's what we make. Um, what were the other parts of the question? <laughs> oh, where do we make it? Okay, so we make it in Greenpoint, Brooklyn mm -hmm. currently. And that's pretty much it. Great. Uh, and Colin, if you can talk a little bit about Kings County Distillery. Sure. So uh, Kings County Distillery is the first craft distillery to open in New York since Prohibition. And we make mm, whiskey most of the time. Colin, um, if you can talk a little bit about Kings County Distillery. Um, so uh, we make whiskey most of the time, but we also, during the pandemic, pivoted to make hand sanitizer. And whiskey is <laughs> maybe a small secret that whiskey is, is is just chemically the same as hand sanitizer. So um, as a joke among staff, we were sort of toying with the idea, but when people actually were running short of it in hospitals and medical uh, environments, um, we switched entirely to making sanitizer until through, through basically June, and now we're back to whiskey, so. And you're in the Navy Yard? And we're in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, under normal conditions, you can come for tours, but we do have a tasting room that is open, the outdoor part of our tasting room. So you actually still can come visit Kings County okay. uh, and have a cocktail and a flight. Awesome. Uh, and Christina, can you talk a little bit about Make Lab? Hi. Yeah, so I'm Christina. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Make Lab. We're a B2B on-demand additive manufacturing service that helps businesses um, that are engineering or creative-based prototype, complete low volume production runs, or create custom models. Um, so we do a lot of 3D printing, basically. Um, we're located right by Metrotech in downtown Brooklyn. Great. And last but not least, uh, Michael Bednar from Bednar Studios, if you can talk a little bit about your pre-COVID days. 
Yes, um, Bednark Studio is a company I founded 15 years ago. We are a custom fabrication company. Uh, we're vertically integrated, so we're sort of a one source for our clients. We do anything from architectural millwork to experiential marketing, uh, mobile tours, custom trucks. Uh, we're building a bunch of trailers for uh, Ski Mountain right now. So basically anything custom that you've designed, that's what we'll make for you. Um, and we're located in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We moved there a year ago, and we have a 65,000 square foot uh, manufacturing space there. Amazing. Wow. All right, great. Uh, so now we're back in 2020 and in COVID times. So uh, my company, Course of Trade, produced uh, isolation gowns during the COVID, uh, you know, the peak of the COVID uh, spike in New York City for the new NYC EDC. So we were deeply immersed in everything PPE. So I wanted to go around and talk a little bit about, you know, the, just the timeline. I mean, I know from my experience, it was kind of a wild ride. So uh, let's start uh, with Colin. So can you just talk about how this all started? Yeah, I mean, it, I, I guess, yeah, it, was, it started as a joke, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Alcohol is, you know, people don't really realize that the same stuff you drink is vodka or whiskey is the same stuff you put in your car or you use as an industrial solvent. <laughs> um, so as it turns out, the World Health Organization published a recipe um, as to how you could turn your vodka or whatever you might have at hand into hand sanitizer. And so we went out and sourced some glycerin and hydrogen peroxide. Um, and there was some question about the legality of whether or not a beverage distillery could make sanitizer. And we were kind of like, damn the torpedoes, we're gonna just do it because it really did seem like New York was short on it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but fortunately right before we were about to launch, um, the government did issue this temporary sort of guidelines for how beverage distillers could make hand sanitizer. Um, and so we did that and, um, you know, furnished individuals who could come to our website on a pay what you wish basis, but also had plenty of surplus that we could send around to, uh, you know, to hospitals, nursing homes, they, like the FedEx guys, we gave a whole case to them. You know, it was, it, was a, it was a great gift to be able to share it with people, you know, in particular in March and April and May when things were particularly bad in New York. Wow, and what, at your peak height of production, how much were you producing? I think in the end we made um, about 15,000 bottles. So our bottles were sort of this size. Um, this is this is the whiskey that we make for sale. This is the whiskey that we uh, put. I'm sorry, this is the hand sanitizer. Um, so, but but what's interesting about the hand sanitizer? It's it's twice as potent as the whiskey that you drink. So it was actually pretty expensive for us to produce. Mm -hmm. And um, fortunately, a lot of breweries had beer in the tap lines around the city that was going, you know, it was just gonna go stale. So we ended up taking a lot of beer from breweries in every borough and then distilled that into sanitizer and then shared it with the breweries for them to distribute. So in a way we, we found a way to really kind of <laughs> corner the alcohol community <laughs> in a way that we could um, make it uh, productive for as many people as possible. And then of course Purell figured out how to Make a lot more sanitizer. <laughs> um, but I, I should also say, since then we 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 have one thing that people are short on is is community, and so um, we have opened our reopened our tasting room, and we do virtual whiskey tastings. So you can sign up, and we'll ship you five different three to five samples of whiskey, and you can have a distillery tour guide lead you through those samples at home over Zoom. So that's another way in which we've sort of pivoted, but that's more, you know, in line with our core business. That's very inventive. That's really <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's fun. People, people have a good time with it. That's awesome. Uh, and Ella, can you talk about what how your company pivoted? Yeah, so how it started for us was early March, we started receiving some messages through our social media from nurses. Um, and this is honestly, I think right before New York got hit really hard, it was mostly in Washington at the time. 
And so nurses were reaching out to us saying like, hey, we're desperate. We have run out of PPE. We're wearing scarves to take care of patients. And it's just like a very terrible situation. Is there any way that you could make us some masks? I have no idea how these people found us, but I started thinking about it and I'm like, okay, this is gonna start spreading really quickly. Let's come up with some sort of solution, even if we're just gonna volunteer our time to crank out some masks for these people in Washington. And so what we did was, I think a couple of weeks later, like we got shut down as well. So what happened was we had to close down our manufacturing here in Brooklyn um, and we pivoted to this distributed manufacturing model where we had sewers sewing from home to create face masks for the front lines. And we called our initiative face masks for the front lines. And very quickly overnight, my co-founder and I built a site where any maker in the United States could sign up as a volunteer and any hospital could also register as a hospital and they could indicate how many masks they were in need of and their desired timeline for when that would happen. And we essentially would match the maker with the hospital. Um, so what ended up happening was like we created a robust document that outlined how to make the type of mask we were looking for, what types of materials can be used for that. Because in the beginning, we were not sending out materials to the makers. It was mostly volunteer based. So we just said, hey, if you have any cotton, if you have any linen, this is kind of what the CDC is recommending. Um, obviously, like desperate times come for des count for desperate measures. And in the cases of uh, what we were experiencing, it was almost like anything you could use to create these face masks. Um, so there was a downloadable pattern. We had over, I think, 500 or more makers that had registered. And then I think over the span of a couple months, um, similar to you, Colin, I think we, we sent out about 15,000 masks, which was awesome. And it was all volunteer based. Um, we started to get some press around it, which also helped and we took in some donations. So we ended up being able to provide a lot of the makers with materials. And we also covered the shipping expenses. Um, so that was, that was great. Like they weren't the best quality, but also in the beginning before N95s could get ramped up mm -hmm. with like major mass, uh, production, we just took the initiative and we're just like, okay, let's, let's make this happen. And since then we pivoted a little bit further and then started actually selling masks ourselves for consumers. And this was again, right when we were all in the beginning, obviously they're like, masks don't matter. You don't need to wear masks. And then there was the moment where we shifted and then everyone's wearing masks. So right at that moment, we had been producing masks for everyday consumers and that went really well and really kept our business afloat for the first couple of months uh, during the pandemic. And yeah, I mean, we've kind of wound that down a little bit. Again, there's a lot of other resources now. In the beginning, it took a while for these larger companies to ramp up to be able to produce inexpensive masks. So ours were, you know, a relatively high price point because again, they're all made locally and we had to pay the sewers. So that's kind of where we were at. And we're starting to wind it down now. We're still selling masks uh, to consumers, but once hospitals had access to the PPE they needed, it started kind of dwindling down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And your sewers were all over the country? Yes, so we were using the sewers that we use here mm -hmm. to produce our you know, core product, which was these upholstery goods. But then we realized there's a much bigger need than we can actually help with right now. So at that point, we're like, let's band together our resources. Let's build something that's very easy to use, which is a very simple website that kind of guided the maker through how to, to do these face masks. And that, you know, went from doing 500 a week to like double or triple that a week with just the, the sheer number of volunteers. And it was really, really cool to see so many people just come out of the woodwork and come together to be like, hey, I really just want to help out. You know, how do I, how do I help? I don't want anything in return. And we try to reimburse every single person for their shipping. And a lot of the people would be like, please don't reimburse me. Like I need to give back to the community. And we sent masks, obviously in New York when things were really bad here compared to other states, it was more towards where the demand was needed at the time. So New York was, you know, I think most of the masks probably went to New York, but 
I remember we had at least one maker in, I think, 49 states, which was really cool to see. And I had no expectation for where this was going to go, but it was really amazing to see so many people just come together. I think that was really one of the most inspiring things about this is just seeing the sheer amount of community building that happened and you know, really people learning from each other and banding together is really, it, it, it truly does take a, a village to make something like this happen. Totally. So that gave me a little bit of hope for, yeah, for like, you know, the, the hard times that we had, so. And Christina, can you talk about Make Lab? Yeah, so um, I think two weeks right after um, we sent everyone home and we're a really small company. So it was just myself and my co-founder and we were running production. Um, so we were still running client orders at the time. Um, two weeks in, we we saw a decline and we saw an opportunity to start making face shields. So we put a site together. We got the open source files from the maker community and we started printing like right away. Um, one of the challenges that we found were the whole East Coast didn't have PET, which was the clear visor portion. So we were like, how do we get this? And also there was, a, there was a shortage of elastics. So we got really, you know, like Ella said, desperate times call for desperate measures. So we actually sourced Avery um, clear plastic binder dividers, which was really interesting. It actually aligned right with the holes that you would affix the clear visor to. It was perfect and it stayed. And instead of elastic, we just use rubber bands. So we would loop two together and then just um, like like string it along the hooks. And so that was also good because, you know, when you're talking about bacteria and like viruses, you want to be able to, to, to clean it. And elastic is more difficult. So rubber bands actually worked out. Um, so we were selling them online at first. And then we really just wanted to make an impact and be part of the community. So we actually just set up a GoFundMe and started donating. And we donated to several hospitals. We pulled all the stops with our team. I sent boxes of unassembled shields to every team member, to anyone, to like friends and family that was that like were volunteering to help out. Um, other other people in our network volunteered to like print stuff and then send it to us, which was so incredibly kind. Like that, that was like so inspiring, just like Ella was saying about community. And, um, and so we were doing the donation thing for a while. And as face shields were kind of winding down, we, we partnered with a company called Bellis 3d where they use your iPhone to like make a 3d scan of your face. So you would have a custom mask fitter. So we started, we set up shop again, and then we started selling those. Um, and we also did like like mask extenders, ear savers as they call it. So we were doing all that for a while. And I think we made like 5,000 face shields. I don't, I don't know the exact number of custom mask fitters, but it might have, I think it was in the thousands as well. Um, a lot of it was going to the East Coast, but we were also shipping across the country. Um, and yeah, it was an insane. All of it's dwindled down, but yeah. um, I do. I want to hear more about your process of finding all these partners. But first, let's hear um, from Michael. Talk about what the work that Ben Arc Studio did. Yeah, we so we're in the Navy Yard. Um, sort of everything was shutting down. We were panicking, trying to figure out how to keep our business afloat for however long we were going to be um, shut down. And I sort of at one moment, I think it was like mid, you know, mid March, I was like emailing the Navy Yard. I was like, guys, like, what's going on? Like, we're watching these like, you know, news broadcasts and De Blasio and everything. Like, how can we help? Um, and they pretty got they quickly linked us with people at New Lab. So we were working with a company there called 10X Beta, and they were working with MIT to create the um, that ventilator, the emergency ventilator that they created. So early on, we were just cutting parts for them, and then they were like driving them up to MIT. Um, and then the Navy Yard came to us and like, there's going to be a huge need for face shield. Like they're first like, can you make face masks? I'm like, nah, not really. I don't have any sewing machines or anything like that. Can you make face shields? And that was like something that was very much in our wheelhouse. Um, so on like a Friday night, I built a, a pitch deck that they sent to the department of health. And then the next day we made, they said, this looks great. The next day we made prototypes. And then on Sunday morning, we met with the department of health. Um, and they got approval and they're like, we need 500,000 as soon as you can get it. And we're like, okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we went back to the shop on a Sunday 
basically I'd sent everyone home on Friday and it was just my executive board. So it was like three of us in the shop all weekend, cutting parts for these ventilators, trying to figure out how to make these face masks. And then we had to source our supply chain on that Sunday into Monday. We found um, a local supplier in Williamsburg, like the last building that has like full of foam and rubber parts. Right. I'm like, this is the most expensive real estate I know of in New York City and you like right. full of foam. <laughs> um, so they partnered with us, they made all our foam sort of front pieces. That was like an adhesive back piece of foam. Um, the PETG that you're talking about was you know, a wild ride for several months. Um, but luckily we sort of got some orders in very early on the front end. Um, and then we continued to source it all across the country. And the elastic, which you're talking about as well, we sourced as much as we could here. And then we were buying it from overseas. Um, we basically were like calling on our community of like people that we know in the fashion industry um, you know, the pl our plastic suppliers and our foam suppliers, like working with them to figure out, cause like we would be wiring like hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy elastic and being like, are you real? Are you like a <laughs> 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 you Will you get model? here in one week or one month? <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> uh, then on that Monday morning, we met, um, the Navy Yard hooked us up with DeGaulle Visual Solutions and they, we coordinated with them and they, um, donated their space, which they have this huge greenhouse or like a huge um, space there. You could saw those in the video um, earlier. And we set up a manufacturing space in there. We ended up, um, we, we hired about 150 new employees through social media. Um, and we basically put in a ton of people, like um, protection, you know, everyone came in and they check in, they do the thermometer. This is all like in March before anyone knows anything, everyone gets face masks. So we gave away all all our face masks, and then the people were trying to buy face masks for the people assembling face shields um, on the assembly line. We also um, catered lunch every day for everyone so they didn't have to go out because everyone's sort of risking, you know, there's health and safety coming in. So we served lunch every day so they didn't have to go back out and try to figure out how to deal with lunch. Um, and we ramped up in the end of that week, we delivered 50,000 face shields um, to the Department of Health and then over the next 90 days, we uh, manufactured 2.7 million face shields. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was just crazy. I mean, sourcing um, material, um, having our teams cutting uh, like raw goods all day around the clock. Um, but we, yeah, we continued to get really good feedback on the product that we were making. So the, um, the city kept buying more shields from us. Um, and we ramped down uh, into July, like July 30th, so the last day of manufacturing that. Um, also within that, so we pivoted into the face shields and then we we're like, okay, the, all this plastic at this thickness um, is being used for face shields, but we know there's like plastic a little thicker, like what could we do with that plastic? So then we were like, okay, let's divide this uh, design dividers for Ubers. So we came up with like a non-damaging Uber divider um, that we were basically getting cut and then it gets like sort of bungeed into the car. And we also wanted it to be really low cost because um, we didn't want to be like burdening um, the drivers with already a tough situation. So we, I, lear I learned how to build websites. I learned how to get, do a scheduling app. <laughs> I learned how to get take credit cards online. Um, there's like all these things that went into that. But now we've uh, installed close to 5,000 of those into Ubers um, and Lyft drivers across uh, New York City. And we also were sending out um, our drawings and our how we are making our shields to our other partners across the country. So in LA and um, Chicago, where two of our partners were, and also Portland. Um, so we we're trying to be open source and um, help everyone as much as we can. We we're very, very, very fortunate to be in the Navy Yard to be connected with the city because mm -hmm. um, there was so much like fraud and stuff going on that it was hard to figure that out. Yeah, um, really. Wow. Yeah. I think you guys might be some of the more inventive people I have ever had the pleasure of meeting. <laughs> this is a, an amazing group of people. And I think that's really uh, what was so amazing about seeing everyone mobilized during this pandemic is, you know, the beautiful thing about New Yorkers is that we are so able to just turn on a dime and produce and make it happen. And I think that's what this is really indicative of is really just the ability of people to pivot and make it happen. But I know that there are plenty of roadblocks that happen along the way. 
and logistical nightmares that need to get figured out. When we were making gowns, we realized that when we piled the fabric too high, it would all fuse together. And then, <laughs> you, <laughs> so we had to figure out, you know, how do we cut it without it all melting? And it was this really kind of a, a crazy learning experience. And I'm sure you guys have stories about that too. So Ella, if you want to start and kind of talk about some of the, the obstacles that you ran into, some of the logistics that you had to figure out. Yeah, so in the beginning, I think the hardest part was just managing everything remotely and trying to create this production process that was split into so many different places. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, the hospitals that we were working with in the beginning for the Frontlines Initiative, we were very clear that they're gonna get all different types of masks, all different types of qualities. You're essentially getting a piece of fabric that's gonna cover your face. Right. And there are like very low expectations for that. But over time, we were actually able to refine that just through tech and you know providing very simple resources to all the makers. And once we started to bring the production back home, um, where we were doing most of it in Brooklyn, we were still doing the same style of manufacturing, like when we started selling them for our company. But we had a full package for them ready to go, like a sample to match exactly and what type of stitching and the exact length of the elastic around the ear. And so it became a little bit more refined over time. But I think the biggest challenge was communicating. Um, and a lot of the makers that we and the volunteers that we were working with um, were not very tech savvy. So trying to communicate with them and make sure that we were delivering on time to the hospitals or we were communicating what the delivery date was gonna be. You know, sometimes we had to create even a simpler system of just a Google form where internally we're like, oh, this this way that we're building this site is seems very simple, but then it's, ve it's actually not, you know, to most people. So because a lot of the makers were a lot older, you know, a lot of them, 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of time on their hands to just sit down and they're like, hey, I really just want to start selling a bunch of things and they might not even have a computer. So that was, like, I think, the biggest challenge in the beginning. And then we sort of kind of worked it out after understanding what all the challenges were. But that's what I would say. And did you ever get to a point where you were like, wow, there's too many people sewing? Like, it, was it this overwhelming response or how did how did it play out? Yeah, it was overwhelming. So we essentially had a Google form for the makers to sign up on and I would get a notification every time a maker signed up. And in the beginning, the first week, it was maybe like five or six people. But then we started gaining some press and word of mouth. And we also created a Facebook group for all the makers to kind of go to mm -hmm. so that they could exchange questions and any complications that they were running into or suggestions of where to buy goods and materials and or they would share materials which was also cool to see you know someone's like hey i got some extra elastic let me send it to you hey i have some extra cotton let me send it to you um but yeah i mean it started at you know five or ten and then we started seeing like 20 people sign up a week 30 people sign up a week and i was just like oh gosh how are we going to handle all these people but we automated the system so that once they signed up, they got an email that said like, welcome to being a volunteer. Here's what you do. We made it very simple. And there wasn't a lot of communication between us and the makers. It was actually pretty streamlined. Then once they were ready to ship, they chose, you know, based off of priority, which hospital to ship to. Wow. And then they just input what their shipping cost was, sent a receipt, and then the anticipated delivery date, and that was all communicated to the hospital immediately. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, it was very hands-on because we were trying to navigate, like, how do we build out something that we don't have to spend, you know, so much, re so many resources on or so much time on? And eventually it started running itself, which was really cool. So then what we saw was we just get notifications for how many masks had been delivered to hospitals. Cool. And then the cool part was, you know, a lot of the hospitals would send us photos or, you know, send thank yous. And, and that was really cool to see. Mm -hmm. And after, you know, a certain amount of time, uh, the hospital stopped signing up. So that also started dwindling down. And we also just had a surplus of masks at the end and then just started sending it to food banks here and other organizations that, you know, might need it. Um, so that was kind of our experience. That's awesome. And Colin, I know you talked about the the cost that went into this, right? With, with 
uh, hand sanitizer being more costly than what the whiskey that you typically typically produce. But can you talk about the you know, what compelled you to go into this? I mean, besides just a roundtable conversation of you know what can we do? Was it a, was there a financial aspect to it? I mean, how did this play out for you guys? Yeah, well, I mean, I will say there was, um, you know, we were going into a situation where we no longer could host people and have people come to the distillery. And like many restaurants, um, we were given the opportunity to deliver, but people were not at that point used to getting anything delivered. So if we could say, here's some hand sanitizer. Oh, and by the way, throw in some whiskey if you want, hint, hint. Um, that was a way that um, people could you know, sort of, I, I think ended up, you know, supporting us generously. They bought the sanitizer as a way to kind of help us, but then they would get some whiskey mm -hmm. as well. And it kind of helped people get adjusted to this, what we're now all familiar with, but just the idea of ordering a cocktail and having it shipped or delivered to your door. Yeah. Um, so that was a way that we were able to kind of use making the sanitizer, not just in an altruistic way, but to, 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 also, you know, keep people employed, keep the business running, keep the kind mm -hmm. of core business uh, going a little bit in the background, um, even as we were very much committed to um, distributing the sanitizer as, as widely as we could. And, you know, we, we weren't able to supply the demand whatsoever. I mean, we were artificially limited in the amount of sanitizer that we gave to any one person. GQ ran an article like, this is where you find sanitizer and you know, overnight, I th it was the biggest sales day in company history. But it was all bottles of sanitizer wow. you know, around the country, and you know, we were able to ship sanitizer around the country. But alcohol, we're still prohibited to send only to New York and only during the pandemic. Normally, alcohol is forbidden to ship huh. um, for for distillers at least. So you know, there's a lot of tangle of legal sort of um rules that ultimately um <laughs> some of those had to break down a little bit um in order for us to get through so i would say our our biggest challenge was um just negotiating all of the different rules and talk to mm -hmm. any restaurateur right now and they will tell you that the scourge of the pandemic has been dealing with the constantly sort of shifting permissions that have been given and so we've we've been adjusting to that a little bit and sanitizer was one way to kind of rise above that and just kind of uh, be visible at a time when people were really just kind of not sure what to do. Yeah. I will say that I think the to-go cocktails has been mm -hmm. without a doubt my favorite <laughs> aspect of COVID. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. a pretty low bar, I guess. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, Christina, will you talk about how you found some of your suppliers and you know how you how you made these connections? Yeah, so um, we called me and my team. We called pretty much every PETG supplier I think on the East Coast and hit every single wall. And I remember there was one distinct conversation with one of the big ones, and they and we asked for it. And they, they laughed, and we shared a moment where we both laughed, and we're like, "Yeah, you know, a month from now we'll have it, but <laughs> good luck." So that's when we found the 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 um, Avery, and no one else was was using that in in bulk like we were. So we were able to pretty much clear out one of the Amazon stores online with two day shipping, which was perfect. And then we contacted Avery. Um, I think the president, I just messaged him on LinkedIn and he gave us a discount code, which was super nice and very cool. And I told him a little bit about what we did. And then I just, I just had all these, um, like e-commerce shops lined up in case. Um, and we just overbought too, just in case. Mm -hmm. Um, then with the foam that was also off of Amazon because we were just operating at such like a smaller, smaller, um, operation than Michael was. <laughs> so we were able to to do Amazon for a lot of it. Mm -hmm. I think logistically it was it was really tough to like really manage all the orders going coming in and then going out. 3D printing can take a really long time. So printing the actual headbands, um, we would print 16 at a time and they would take like 24 hours. Wow. So it was just like managing the queue and just back to back and try hoping that we didn't you know, that we did enough 
maintenance before all this that our printers wouldn't break down in the middle of it. And, you know, we were leaving, leaving hospitals and other organizations like open, like empty handed, mm -hmm. we were hoping that was that wouldn't happen. And it didn't happen. Um, I think it maybe happened once, uh, but we got it up. We got it back up and running pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah. what was the pro So when you discovered that these um, Avery plastic sheets would work, I mean, how did you even get there? Like, how did, how were you like, this might be working, this might work. <laughs> it was, um, it was very interesting. I think we were really just a little discouraged and we, we were on Zoom. And then one of my uh, team members' roommates came and was like, hey, I think this fits. Maybe this will work. <laughs> and then he tried it and we were like, oh, okay. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> it was that very genius. That's yeah. really smart. <laughs> yeah. I feel like if there's anything that we we do really well is because we're like industrial designers by trade and engineers, we figure things out pretty quickly. And so, yes, this was luck, but I mean, just creative solutions are our nature as well. So mm -hmm. it, it fits right in. But um, yeah, it, and then managing the network of volunteers that were helping to assemble everything and putting all the boxes um, of like quantities of 50 in Ubers to send to them and then sending them shipping labels and just organizing all of that, I think, as like a, a two person <laughs> operation pretty much was was a little tough. That was that was tough. Yeah, that's a lot to juggle. For sure. For mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> and Michael, I think so you were operating on a wild scale. So I'm sure you had you know, problems that we do not encounter. So can you talk a little bit about sort of the logistics of, of operating something at that size? Um, I mean, we brought, we sort of just, our key players in our company obviously stepped up um, and sort of took roles in like a completely just different company as our same company, but brand new company. Um, we just had a lot of internal staff that really stepped up as well. They went, you know, from like, you know, um, managing our facilities to managing a whole, you know, a whole team of people. Um, I think the biggest, you know, like, hurdles we had to think, hit were, um, one, like we had, so we had staff working from home and we also had, like anyone that was work is all, you know, 75% of our staff has to work physically in a location. And so there are a lot of people who were just staying home, socially distancing, didn't want to come in. But we also had other people like our project management project management staff that can work from home. So they were doing that and they were doing the sourcing. Um, and what I wasn't picking up on um, that sort of was related to me sort of, you know, mid-April was like our work from home staff like is really missing the community. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have this community anymore. Whereas like I was in the office the whole time with like, my key staff there and then we also had other staff on assembly line floor with like you know 200 people every day um so there's that community there like the that took on a whole life of its own they were doing like formal fridays and hawaiian shirt wednesdays and like <laughs> they had like the best time i mean it was like horrifying time but they were like making the best of it um so there's like a really good core group there and people did come through um, but it was just making sure the people that were working from home, like trying to make sure they felt like part of the community um, and part of what we were doing. And I sort of dropped the ball on that in the beginning. I tried to make up for it. Um, so we started doing coffee things in the morning where everyone could dial in or we do like um, fun little sort of like uh, Colin was saying, like tastings. We did like hard seltzer tastings one week. Um, <laughs> So it was like just making sure everyone was okay and feel, felt safe. And then, you know, obviously making sure that the where the assembly line was, was we, we couldn't have an outbreak there. So we making sure everyone was coming in and being checked. Um, I think those were the big challenges um, for our people. Um, and then we had the same other stuff, you know, just trying to source crazy things mm -hmm. and hit deadlines and make sure you're not letting down people and things like that. And did you run into any sourcing issues? I mean, of course you did. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah we had like, our vendors went into competition with us. So we had ordered, you know, like hundreds of thousands, you know, I think we went through 76,000 sheets of PETG. So our vendors were like, oh, now we're gonna start making these. Like we were like literally like 24 hours ahead of some of the other manufacturers that went into this. So we were like making orders, but then they'd be like, oh, we don't know where that went. We, we had those sheets for you yesterday. And you were like, uh, <laughs> 
And so there was like a lot of that. I mean, price of a sheet, you know, we'd lock in POs for 500,000 sheets and or 500,000 shields. And we'd lock it in knowing the price for PTG was $12 a sheet. And then the next day it would be $33 a sheet. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there was like stuff like that. The foam guy was like s s simply only working for us. He was getting a lot of people reaching out to get him to do it for us, but we were having him make like 40,000 pieces of foam a day. Yeah. So he was like, as long as you keep sending me, I'm not going anywhere else. Um, <laughs> we also like, you know, we had to ramp up. We had some crazy deadlines. So our first day we made 5,000 shields and by the end of it daily, we were making 35,000 face shields a day. So there was like that ramp. Uh, mm -hmm. and other things just making sure like design for manufacturing like we we've designed a product that can be easily assembled by people that have never assembled the product like this um also making sure it's not going to fail in the field uh, we don't want to send a hospital like 200 face shields and they're all junk mm -hmm. um, so we like we did sort of a weave thing in this in the side versus a rivet um and it was adjustable um and then we also had to dumb it down as like as the POs grew, the cost that was as like, cause then the sort of the supply was coming back in and there was sort of those things happening. So we had to get comp more competitive, more competitive, more competitive each round. So we have to like refigure out how we're doing it. Can we like make it a little smaller? Can we do this? Can we get, instead of 30 shields per sheet, can we get 42 shields per sheet? Can we cut, like I think by the end, our CNC team went from cutting 5,000 shields or 6,000 shield a day that they could, on a 10 hour shift, they could cut 20,000 shield blanks. So there was a lot of that going through in efficiencies, trying to make it more cost effective for the city. Because in the beginning, they were willing to pay more for the product it's made in New York. But then as it went on, they're like, well, we can also just go to, we can get these imported shields. So we were trying to compete with overseas um, stuff mm -hmm. that was coming online as the time went on. Right. And I think that's what a lot of makers found out is, you know, there's obviously I think this really highlighted the importance of domestic manufacturing. I mean, we have to be able to make something here and we have to preserve mm -hmm. that talent for situations, hopefully not exactly like this. Hopefully there's never mm -hmm. a situation exactly like this. Yeah. But, you know, it is just such an important uh, skill set for all of us to have and all of us to maintain. Yeah. Uh, so I want to spend the last 10 to 15 minutes talking about the future and how this plays out for you for, you know, going forward. Once COVID is no longer a thing, you know, what, what how does this impact you? And you know, how do you incorporate some of the lessons that you learned over the course of this into your business on a go forward? So Ella, do you want to start uh, just kind of big picture? What does this look like for you? Yeah, so we definitely have, you know, shut down the the front lines initiative, but a lot of this, the lessons that were learned through the process of, you know, being able to adapt and shift very, very fast mm -hmm. has only helped us, I think, as a company moving forward with no matter what product we're producing. And it also has proven that this interesting model of maybe not manufacturing everything in one location actually can work. And that was an idea that I had even pre-COVID, like how do we maximize production? And, you know, people like working from home. This was, I don't know if anyone likes working from home these days, but <laughs> prior to COVID, you know, I was like, what a cool idea if someone has a sewing machine and they can produce something to the quality expectation that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can be a, a, a mom at home and you can like produce these items and you can make money and you don't have to go into this assembly line. Like, how can we make something like that work? And it was always something on the top of my mind, but this kind of propelled that forward really, really quickly. And we had to test this model and we had this ability to be able to test that. Um, so one thing that we're definitely moving forward with and continuing to do today is have this distributed manufacturing model where, you know, every step of the process is done by different parties in different locations. And there are, you know, problems that arise with that and challenges, but it has allowed us to honestly start to scale the, the core business without needing more space, which was one thing that was a struggle because, I mean, New York City rent is just high in general, right? So mm -hmm. the more space that you need, the harder it is to pay that. And so like, how do we stay in this like relatively small location, but continue to scale the business? Um, so that was 
a really big testament to my team and being able to manage all that and definitely something that had proven to work. So it's very exciting to be able to move forward with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's the primary thing that I learned throughout this is that there's so many different ways to manufacture something and it doesn't have to be, you know, there are inefficiencies within that type of process, but then there's also benefits to it as well, where people are staying home, you know, you don't have to worry, like Michael, you were saying about the production line getting infected and what happens in that case where you get 200 people and then it's wiped out and who's doing the production. So mm -hmm. I think there are safety measures that we have to put into place now that we never had to even think about prior to COVID that might just be beneficial for us as companies moving forward in general. Mm -hmm. And this way of thinking of, you know, how do we integrate people who are remote in a manufacturing sense, I think is kind of transformative for the industry as a whole, right? If we can yeah. keep bringing more people in who are, uh, you know, maybe they're, they're moms with young kids who need a more flexible schedule or, you know, caretakers, how can we really start bringing people back and making sure that they have great jobs? I think it's a really, uh, that's a really laudable effort. It's awesome. Thanks. And Colin, so where, how do you see this playing out for you? I mean, are you still are you gonna continue with yourself? Uh, well, we do have sanitizer mm -hmm. on hand. I mean, we basically produced what we thought would take us to the end of the year and probably overproduced. So we will have sanitizer till, um, till the next pandemic. <laughs> um, we're all good. Um, but I, I, if I, I mean, I think if we learned anything, it was really just that our competitive advantage, our uh, our competition is big spirits companies like Diageo and, uh, you know, our people think of Bullet and Maker's Mark and as these like craft whiskeys, when in fact, they're just these, you know, sort of huge corporate things. And to be able to read the community and give the community not just the product that it needs, but just the the sort of support and, you know, to kind of be with the community with what they're feeling, um, I think was a big opportunity for us. Like when the uh, Black Lives Matter protests, mm -hmm. we were sitting on a hand sanitizer and that was a lot of people who were going out into the streets and we had all been in our apartments for so long. Um, it was an opportunity to kind of be there for that moment in the community too. So I think um, our ability to sort of be nimble and to read the people, our neighbors, has kind of always been our competitive advantage, but even more so now. And you know, to see the big spirits companies sort of say, well, we're giving a million dollars to bartenders. Nobody ever saw that money nobody ever, you know, it's kind of a gesture that never quite lands but to actually be there with our liquor stores and restaurants and um, constituency, our audience, um, I think is something that will stay with people. I hope it stays with people for a long time um, and helps you know, build our company in a way that, um, that I would never have imagined would come out of this. Mm -hmm. And as you prepared you know, enough hand sanitizer to last you until the end of the year, did you, <laughs> factor in the potential for a second wave. Yes, and I think at this point, probably, um, again, there's still, the other people have gotten so savvy about mm -hmm. how to do things inexpensively. Um, at this point, we're, we're a novelty. We make a cool hand sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you want an edgy hand sanitizer. Smell like whiskey with a little bit of a, you know, a hint of hydrogen peroxide. Um, we have got the sanitizer for you. Um, so yeah, but I think really more the, the, the way that we'll kind of deal with a, another wave is that sort of virtual tastings. I mean, we're still meeting over Zoom, you know, so as long as that's going on and we can find a way to bring groups together, companies and their employees, or um, just, you know, clubs that used to have, have opportunity to meet together if we can do something for that group, you know, then, uh, you know, people are having a good experience with our brand. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that over the next six months, that's really how we end up, um, you know, staying, staying in business. I mean, we're still, you know, <laughs> it's, it's still a hard time. There's this rumor that everybody's drinking more during the pandemic, but it's not nearly enough to compensate for what's been lost at bars and restaurants. People aren't, 
the pandemic alcoholics do not outweigh the sort of social drinking that everybody used to do. So um, consumption is is down and that's because socializing is down. And if we could mm -hmm. get socializing back up, it would be good for business and and mental health. I don't know. I don't know if more alcohol is really the solution to mental health issues, but um, uh, maybe in a small amount. In moderation, I guess. <laughs> we should be a disclaimer under your... <laughs> yeah. And I bet uh, hand sanitizer that smells kind of like whiskey will be great for when people start going back to work. You know, you really... <laughs> I did get a few comments from people who bought it, and they they said, you know, this, this smells like whiskey. And I was like, what's your thing? Like, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. And Christina, do you want to talk about some of the lessons that you learned, and you know, things that will carry you forward? Yeah. So um, we we actually also made um, and donated face shields for to Made in NYC for the Black Lives Matter protest, which was Thank awesome. You. I think one big thing that I took away, I mean, it's so easy to get siloed as an entrepreneur and as a founder and like in your own bubble and in your own world, but just that feeling of being able to give back and really help and use what you've built to help was just, it, it gave us a sense of purpose that I want to keep carrying through. And so we, now we know moving forward, you know, hopefully we don't have a pandemic again and hopefully, you know, I don't know, we just want to be able to pivot to help other movements and socioeconomical situations as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just making that a part of our DNA and a part of our culture moving forward. Um, the other interesting thing is that we actually worked with a few different gyms to produce branded face shields, which was very interesting. Cool. So we worked with um, Dog Pound, um, specifically their LA location. I an old high school friend of mine, her fiance is like the brand um, director of Dog Pound and, and he contacted us. And so we did a, this cool collaboration. Um, so that, that was pretty cool too. It was just, you know, we live in such a prototyping world, Make Lab. Um, we mm -hmm. work with designers and engineers to get things printed um, that never really see the world. They're not end use products. But I think one thing that we've learned is that it's it's actually, even though we just we're just making plastic, it's actually really easy to make and use products. So just a little bit of creativity and and we can do it. And and just weaving in that that um giving back mentality too is just su super important to us now. Mm -hmm. It seems like creativity is in no short supply. So it's amazing. Exactly. And the power of community is overwhelming. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. And Michael, do you want to talk about your your carry forward lessons? Um, so we basically took, once we got the face shield thing sort of running, we really took that time to like take a pause in our co in our company and like look around. We had been growing and being crazy and like felt like on a never ending treadmill of insanity. So we really took that time. We're like, okay, we have no, no projects to work on right now. So let's figure out how we should be working when this all comes back. So we really went in internally um, trying to figure out what to do. So we've like, you know, new cost tracking, new project management softwares, um, whole company reorg. Uh, we gave, in the beginning of the pandemic, our main staff took a 15% pay cut across the board. The leadership took a 40% pay cut. Um, so then we re, introduced once we could come back we then gave everyone new offers we like really just drilled down um on our process we used a company to like make sure we were paying everyone in scale with what new york city gets the what you get paid for your job position in new york city so we like i think it was called like pay scale or something there's like all these different things you can do for that um so we really like looked internally we were like what's working what's not working hey who in each department who should really be running this department is that person that's running that department actually should they be running the whole shop you know yeah. there was things like that that we really drilled into um and we also just had employees that didn't come back you know they were like oh i moved to maine in april and i love yeah. maine so i'm saying <laughs> it was great yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. so there's like we lost a lot of employees through that Mm -hmm. um and so we had to make adjustments and we're now we're operating at a third of what we used to operate at um, wow. 
So we're, you know, 40, 40% of our business was like large scale events and like big, you know, in real life social gathering uh, projects. So that business is completely gone. Um, and we've been, we have like a millwork division and we also do retail. So the millwork team is seeing some growth and we're getting some business in there. And then the retail stuff, we're finishing stuff from uh, pre-COVID. Those like stores that were supposed to open in April and May are now opening in September and October. So we're trying to finish those stores. And we're also like, I'm just, I basically during the pandemic now, I'm just strictly um, like marketing and trying to find new business for us. So I've been like doing a ton of LinkedIn and We've, we've been talking with the elevator company here in the Navy Yard, so we're going to be building elevator interiors for them. Like, just like completely nothing I've ever thought about in my life. Like, I mean, I like elevators. I go in them and I appreciate them, <laughs> but like, I didn't think I'd be building them. <laughs> so now we're going to be building a bunch of elevators. Um, and just like, yeah, we're and we're also doing some more design work on the front end, um, trying to win contracts that way with people because mm -hmm. people are like, we just won a contract with this um, ski mountain company. They own like a bunch of mountains all over the country. Yeah. And they're looking for efficiencies, right? They're like, we get to just get this designed and, and get it built. So like by coming directly to us, we can design it while we're engineering it and tell them the cost very quickly. Um, so there's things like that that we're working on. I mean, it's sort of a new, I mean, we have no idea what's going to happen. If there is a second wave, um, it's pretty, it's not going to be good. Um, but yeah, we're just like, we kept really close with our, our clients throughout of it, throughout it. We did a lot of outreach and just checking in on everyone and, um, yeah, just trying to sustain until like that in real life stuff comes back where people can gather again. Cause that's, you know, a large portion of our business. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of that. I think that's kind of amazing way of really restructuring your company is exactly what I think has to happen post post pandemic, right? I, there's no way that all of this can just carry forward in our, with our status yeah. quo. And in some ways it's, I mean, there's a lot of horrible things that came out of this pandemic, but that might be one of the only bright spots is really trying to, is really thinking about the ways that we can revolutionize our companies and think about new ways of, of doing what we do best. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm so happy to know each and every one of you. It's so great. You guys did amazing work and it was really awesome to talk to you. Yeah. And I think, uh, Joanna, if we have audience questions, you can. Yeah. Hi, hey, thanks everyone. Yeah. I'm haven't seen any questions come in the chat, but if anyone who is watching, has questions for um, our moderator, our panelists, please drop them in now. Um, while people drop in questions, I just wanted to thank you all for a really amazing deep dive into all the work that you've been doing over the last, uh, you know, I don't know how long, seven months? I don't, it, time doesn't matter what it's time, yeah. but all the last couple of months, uh, more than a couple months. Um, and I really appreciate sort of this conversation that we're having around something really, um, heavy and it was a very dark time, but there was a lot of humor in the conversation th this evening. And I think that, that you have to have those moments in order to even get through this type of thing. And I also think it really speaks to the resiliency that you have to have in order to be a manufacturer in New York City in the first place and to thrive and succeed and be here. So I just wanted to uplift that and thank you all for those moments and, and for, for telling your stories tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat and we're about to wrap up. So I'll just quickly uh, remind everyone who's uh, still with us that this was an event that was part of Made in NYC Week 2020, which is our annual celebration of New York City's manufacturing and maker community. And this was day seven of eight days of virtual programming, highlighting our manufacturing businesses. So we wrap everything up tomorrow with Factory Friday. Um, the two things that we have going on tomorrow is a Meet the Maker interview on our Instagram Live with one of our members, uh, Gwen Bellotti, and uh, being interviewed by Haley Applebaum from uh, Future of Women on Instagram. But we also have 
virtual factory tours that we've gathered that are on our Made in NYC Week website, madeinnycweek.com. So make sure to head over there and watch those. We've created and gathered all those videos in partnership with the Brooklyn Navy Yard and Open House New York. So just wanted to thank them both as partners in this work, um, as we always work together this time of year to highlight uh, factories and workshops all over New York City. And this year you can view them from the safety of your home and your couch. Um, so yeah, before, and then before I let you go, the one last thing, um, me and NYC Week, we partnered with Uncommon Goods to put together an exclusive online marketplace of Made in NYC products on the Uncommon Goods website. So if you head over to uncommongoods.com, you'll be able to shop locally made products for the entire month of October. Um, and if you know, there, you're always looking for local products, make sure to always check out our website, madeinnyc.org, which has an online searchable directory of our over 1400 and growing uh, Made in NYC members. You can check them out and, and their products. So that is, uh, that's all I got. Thank you. Thanks for celebrating Made in NYC week with us and the manufacturing community and have a great night. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.